Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm so happy to be here to host this show again. Uh, my name is Jacob Alabi, and I'm so glad to have you here today with me. And today is a special edition because I have a mentor, a role model in the house, and he has been so wonderful in the academic space and has helped many people to, to find their destinies abroad. And I speak of no other person but Dr. Babajide Miton Makoli, who is a founder of uh, Illuminati and uh, the co-founder of uh, Wadi, and he is a respected personality in the academic world. You know, it is quite overwhelming to introduce Dr. Babajide because uh, of the awesome achievement that he has been able to achieve. For example, there was a time he had to to be uh, awarded the the prestigious uh, high-ranking RAYFL award by the Union of FIFA. And the person that was introducing him, I watched the video, and the person started, you know, and was unable to finish. So I don't, I don't want my own to be like that because I know that he has actually uh, paced this seat. Uh, set the pace and he has really done wonderfully. So Dr. Babadide, you are welcome here. Thank you for honoring this uh, invitation, sir. Yeah, hi, uh, Jacob. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, you are welcome here, sir. It's such a great honor to have somebody like you in our midst. Oh, yes. Um, thanks for the accolades and for the kind words. Um, I'm just here to make sure I deliver um, value and that people benefit at the end of the day from the interview and the conversation today. Yeah, thank you. All right, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, you know, I, I want us to start from the scratch because this is a very important uh, event and I, do, I want us to make the best use of this opportunity. So I want us to start from the bottom and then work our way to the top. And that means that I'm proposing that we start from your childhood, how you were able to move from trenches to dainties uh, along the line. Okay, so childhood, um, I was born and bred in Lagos. I'm from the son named Macaulay. I'm a Lagosian. So all my life has been in Lagos. I was born in, um, at um, a hospital in, um, on the island. It's actually called um, First Atlantic Hospital. Um, and it's still existing. As a matter of fact, that's the hospital that... Um, Patrick Sawyer went into that caused the problem, and this woman died. Um, at that devil, yeah, Doctor that devil died in uh, that particular hospital. Was the hospital I was born in um, <clears throat> several years ago, and yeah, so my nursery primary school was in Lagos. I had my nursery primary school at Early Life Nursery and Primary School. That's in Festac Town. It's still standing there. I think one of the best, if I'm not um, arguably one of the best in First Act Town. Um, so I attended early life. And after I finished, although my father wanted me to go to um, King's College, but unfortunately now, because I wrote my common entrance in primary four, and I didn't want to wait till five or six, I had, I think, four or six in my common entrance. King's College were, look, were requesting for, I think, four, 425 or so. So I was far away from the cutoff for King's College. Um, even though my dad was saying I should stay to primary five and do it again, and I'll have a better score, I was insisting I wanted to leave. I just wanted to go. I just wanted to join school, you know, move, move away from primary and then join the secondary. And so that's when we found this new uh, secondary school in First Act Town called um, Kabi College. It's still existing. It's still in First Act Town now. 
Uh, so I joined Kabe College. The Kabe was accepting, I think, 401. And I had 406. So that's how I, over 600, by the way. So, and that's how I ended up uh, in Kabe, where I then had my um, SS1, so, uh, no, uh, GS1, GS1 to GS3. And then I had to leave because we then moved. At the time we were living at Ojo, uh, particularly Iba Housing Estate. Uh, and so we moved to our own building uh, at Abuli Egba. And when you think about Ojo to Abuli Egba, it's like moving from one end to another end of Lagos. So I had to move uh, as well, change school. So when I got to Abuli Egba, uh, area, my, my mom particularly went on a search to look for a proper secondary school for me to start my SS1 to 3. And eventually she found one called uh, Mercy College. Hello? Can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you, sir. Okay, okay. So she found one called Mercy College and Eventually, I joined Mercy College, and by the time I was in SS3, I was made the senior prefect, and I graduated from there, and, and that was the end of my elementary education. It took me four years before I was able to gain admission into the university. I wrote um, the UME four times before I was able to get in. Um, wow. The first wow. time, yeah, the first time I scored... Um, I think it was one one ninety three or so. No, it was one ninety two. The second time I went back, I scored one sixty eight, <laughs> and then the third time, I scored. Um, I think it was two o two o something. I think it was was it? No, no, no. It was two thirteen, and then the final time it was two twenty four. So and then eventually I got into Futa to study biology, and eventually graduated with the first class. So. Yeah. My yeah. journey um, has not been straight at all. Now, I must also add that the reason I wanted to leave primary school at primary four was because I repeated nursery three. So when I repeated nursery three because of my performance that was woeful, my mates had left me and gone to primary one. So by the time I did my common entrance in primary four, my mates had done this in primary five and I wanted to catch up. So that was the reason why I was insisting that I leave in primary four. And eventually I did. So, um, yeah, I had to give that information because I want people to know that I am not a genius. No, I'm not a genius. I'm not this born genius from mother's womb that is just excelling. Everything is straight A. Just doing no, I am not at all. I struggled. I had my difficulties, I repeated, I failed. What I know I am is I'm a fighter. I don't give up. Uh, my biggest strength is fighting, fighting, fighting. And oftentimes I win because I don't give up. So that's the short form of the story. Wow, that's, that's quite intense, I must say. Because, uh, you know, I was going through your profile and I was overwhelmed. I was like, what? But coming to know you personally, I discovered that uh, you have a lot of setbacks back then, but you were able to work through them. So that was why I had to ask about your child. And growing, from, uh, growing in Lagos, I want to ask, how were you able to manage um, you know, strategically, how were you able to have a different uh, world view? Because most of what we know about Lagos is uh, quite, you know, in some sense embarrassing, but you came out of the same place and you are able to make the best use of life. So what was your secret? Okay, thanks, Jacob. Um, so... The truth is every city has got its pros and cons. Um, so this is not a peculiar issue with Lagos. But what will probably make Lagos be a bit different from the rest of the cities in Nigeria 
is because it's the center of excellence. So it's the center of commerce. And a lot of activities go on here. And um, it's the most urbanized city in Nigeria. Not only that, you can literally call it the most populated in West Africa. So because of that, a lot of, and it's congested. So imagine a city of about 28 to 30 mil million people, right? 20 to 30 million people. Uh, and this, the land mass is the smallest in the country. So the smallest state, but has the highest population. So you are talking about congestion. Um, and in cities that are congested, London, uh, Lagos, in Brazil, you have places like Rio de Janeiro. Um, in France, you have Paris. Um, so every country has got a city like, like that. Um, one problem that you'll find is security. Um, you're not sure of your safety um, because it's very easy for you to be robbed. Um, most places are not safe at night. It's always advisable not to move at night and avoid some places at night. When you walk at night, you also need to be careful. You have to be watching your back because someone can come be behind you to steal your phone. And this is normal in any city like that. It was like that in London as well. It is still like that in London. So this is not a peculiar thing to Nigeria. Now, so how do you come out of such um, a location and come out well? How to come out of such a location and come out well is to, yes, yeah, so there is the environment mindset and there is the internal mindset. So there is the external mindset, which is the environment, and there's the internal mindset, which is what's inside your mind. Now, what you need to do is to have control, have some regulation over what happens in your mind. Just like Mahatma Gandhi said, I will not let you walk over my mind with your dirty feet. And that is highly um, significant because it tells you that the mind of the human is like the powerhouse of his reality. That's the powerhouse of his reality. So whatever happens to him or her begins from the mind because as a man thinketh, so he is. So it's almost like your mind will have to birth the reality first before the reality will, will occur. So if you allow your environment to infiltrate your mind, then it's, it's, it's your fault. I never let that happen. Um, I, I was very clear on what I wanted from life. I was also very studious. So I read a lot. I already know what I wanted. I wasn't limited by my location. Um, you can be born somewhere, but you won't be defined by your location. So, and that's exactly who I was. And I, I would say this, um, as a child, I was very different in the sense that, um, Yes, I may tell you I'm not a genius, but I have a highly inquisitive mind in the sense that when I was in school, I'm talking about primary nursery, my teachers always write in my report card, he's always absent-minded. And the reason why they always put this in my report card is because each time I'm in class and they are teaching, let's say, mathematics, and I am lost in thoughts. And they are right. I'll be absent-minded, lost in thoughts. I won't be in that class anymore. What's happening to my mind is, as a child, right? Instead of me to be listening to what the teacher is saying, I'm following what the, maybe 2 plus 2 is 4 or 4 plus 1, you know, is 5. I am asking myself, why is 4 written like that? And who <laughs> is the person that started writing it like that? Wow. <laughs> yeah. And I'll be lost in thought. And the next thing is, Babajide, 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 uh, sir, uh, sir, yes, sir. Um, I'm talking to you. Why are you not here? And so hmm. rather than ask me what was going on, try to oh. understand me, 
they won't ask me. They will just tell me he's always absent-minded. I, we don't know what is wrong with him. And my parents were a bit mm. concerned, right? They were a bit concerned because they were wondering what's going on. Is it that he's unfit for learning? Is it that, mm. I don't know, is he having problem with comprehension? But mm. looking back, I didn't have problem with comprehension. The, the issue is that my mindset, the way I was thinking, was probably too much for my age. Hmm. Yeah, because I was asking questions that my classmates would probably not even think about. Because wow. I was wondering like are, why. I I, yeah, why is number two written like that? Why? And why is this no, number three? Why? Hmm. And who started writing num- uh, numbers like this? Who started writing numbers like this? So, um, I'm saying this because I just wanted to also point out the fact that even though, yes, I can tell you I'm not a genius, I have a highly inquisitive mind. And that helped me with the way I dealt with my environment. I was living in that environment, but because of my inquisitive mindset, um, as a Christian, my favorite book in the Bible was Proverbs. I've been wow. reading Proverbs since I was probably 12 I would read everything, digest all the beautiful words that Solomon was dishing out. And why did I like Proverbs so much? I loved Proverbs so much because it had so much instruction, so much wisdom. It had so Mm. much wisdom. And I was very inquisitive about wisdom, wise words, you know. And I was just 12. So it's very, very strange, right? And so for me as a child, growing up in an environment and then finishing school and maintaining my, um, should I say, internal environment, the way I wanted it, my mind, the way I wanted it, without the environment influencing it, it was easy because I knew exactly what I wanted from life. And the moment... Mm. I go out and people are doing anyhow. I just know that's people. I'm different. I'm different. Wow. Wow. So I, I've, right been, I've, I've been holding myself in a high standard even before I was 18. Impressive. So, so that probably was the reason why it was um, easier for me to, to make it out without... Um, the influence of the environment. That's 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 wonderful, sir. So that means that the the external mindset and the internal mindset, uh, both of them, they were channeled towards a goal of uh, becoming the best that you can be. And it, that is remarkable. Exactly. Now it doesn't mean that. Okay, sorry. Now, please let me just that, add this. Okay, sorry, it doesn't mean that. It um, doesn't mean that. Um, the, the, external the external environment is entirely bad. Is entirely bad. Hmm. It only means, it only means have, a regulatory have, process have a regulatory process that, uh, um, that um, manages how substances manages flow into your mind. Flow into your mind. Don't be so gullible. Don't be so gullible. That anything that you read about, you see around you, everything just has immediate impact on your mind. Then that means there is a problem. You sh- what I advise that you have is a situation where you can regulate what is coming in. You can question it. Then you allow some things in and you disallow some things from coming in. So that's it. And you disallow some things from coming. So that's it. Okay. So I want to ask on studying abroad, was this the your drive? Was it what what really is it the internal mindset and the external mindset that drove you into Pursuing studies abroad. 
Okay, very good question. So my journey with studying abroad, you know, it started off from Futa. I don't know if you get the question, sir. Yeah, 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 I got you. Um, so it all started off from Futa as an undergrad. And so there is the element of external in there. And there's also the element of internal. Now, internal because um, I wanted to be more. External because I had the mentor that influenced me. I saw someone and I saw what happened to the person. And I told myself, I desire this. I want this too. So, and that was when I was in school as an undergrad. So what happened? At the time, there were financial issues happening in my family. So I didn't have enough money and it seriously affected every other thing. And so at the time I was in Futa, but I was really poor. So it was poverty that motivated me to looking for scholarships. And so I came across this scholarship called Total, another company. And then when I saw it attached, you know, on the notice board somewhere around the student affairs area of my school, I read through and I discovered that I needed to write an exam. And my CGPA need, needed to be probably three point something. And at the time I had four point something. So I was just like, I am going to apply for this because I needed the money badly. So I went, wrote it, and by God's grace, I got it. So when I got total and I was paid 150,000 Naira every year till I graduated and they said that's what's going to happen. I, I was like, wow. So there's something like this. Wow, my life started changing. I could now afford certain things. I could now feed better without bothering my parents at all. How much was my school fees? 9,600. And I was paid 150,000. How much was my school fees? Hmm. Right? 150,000 every year. So, um, Jacob, my voice is echoing. I don't know why that is happening. Is it from your end? Okay, it stopped now. Yeah, okay. So it has stopped now. So um, so that was the beginning of my, how will I call it now? Initiation. The beginning of my initiation into so, scholarship world. Um, so that um, was it's still echoing. My, Can you please look at my, what's causing that to happen? How will I call it now? Initiation. Hello, Jacob. Initiation into scholarship world. Hello, Jacob. It's still echoing. Can you please look at what's causing that to happen? I think. I think it's the network. Is the network? I think it's the network. Okay. There's no. There's nothing here. Okay. Anyway, so. Um, yes, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Please, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. I okay, nice I can hear you. Yeah. I think it's better now. Okay. All right. So as I was saying, um, that was the initiation of my, or that was my initiation into the scholarship world. When Total began to pay me 150000 and my school fees was 6000 sorry, 9600 And it was clear that I was, you know, better, living a better life just because I was able to attract this scholarship. And that's when it dawned on me that there are scholarships for grabs if you are smart enough. And so I came across another one called the Federal Government Scholarship. And then I applied for that one as well. And I got it and they paid me 150. So I was receiving 300 every year. And again, that was when it dawned on me that 
you can live a better life. All you need to do is to ensure that you prove that you are smart enough. A group of people are willing to give you the money. And then suddenly, this professor from the United States came to visit us at Futa. He was a former student of my department, Professor Henry Fadamiro. And so, and we've been hearing about him. Now, we, we heard about him because he was the only one who graduated with a first class from my department in 1989. So when I got into that department, we used to hear about him. Oh, only Professor Henry got a first class, 1989. No one else has done it. And that's what we keep hearing. No one else has. No one else has. <laughs> so when I was in 300 level, um, I, I was still not in first class. I was just in 300. We had not written our exam at the time. I was not in first class. I think I was in 4.36 at the time. Um, so the man came by himself. And then I saw him in flesh and blood. And then he addressed us. And he was like, I finished from this department. I am now a professor at Auburn University in the US. And yeah, I used to sit here. I used to do this. I used to do, I sat down and I was starstruck. Like I was looking at him like I had seen a ghost. I was just staring at this man. And I was telling myself that, oh my God. So this is what a first class can do to you. Hmm. Because he's, he said, I made the first class and I was able to attract to myself a scholarship. Uh, he won the, um, what's it called? Cambridge scholarship to, no, 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 it's not. Um, what, what's it called? Rhodes. He won the Rhodes scholarship to Oxford ended up doing his PhD at the University of Oxford from Futa. <laughs> and then from there, found himself a good job in the United States teaching at a university and from there to Auburn, where he has been for about 15 years lecturing. He's now a professor. I looked at this man. His skin was so fresh. Oh, my God, you have no idea. I was staring at him and I'm, and, and I'm like, if this is what first class is going to do to this man, to open doors of opportunities for him to achieve his dreams, I am going to pursue the same. And mm. so that semester, I got a five dot and it took me to 4.5. From wow. 4.36 to 4.50. And so that is what happens when you let the right inspiration flow through your mind and it pushes you to success. Because I just didn't sit down there and say, oh, I want this for myself and I went home. I went to walk my ass off. I went to walk my ass off. I burnt the midnight oil. When my colleagues were asleep, I was awake. And at the end of the day, the hard work paid off because I got a five dots. A's in all the eight courses I took that semester. And that catapulted me from 4.36 to, to 4.50 on the dot. And the moment that happened, I knew within me that I would be able to make a first class. And I eventually did. So um, immediately I graduated, I started the scholarship pursuit. And I won Commonwealth and went to do my master's and later won Commonwealth again and went to do my PhD. Let me add, Professor Henry Fadamiro was one of my referees for Commonwealth. Wow. I ended up reaching out to him and was ex excited. He was happy to write me a reference letter. And yeah, so... He's my mentor. He follows me. He knows what I'm doing. He's aware of every step I take because I told him clearly that he's my inspiration. He's the reason why I started all this winning wow. scholarships and all that. So, yeah. So that's the story of my scholarship journey. On, on scholarships abroad, it's always relevant to have a mentor, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
important. Absolutely important. Yeah. The reason I ask that is because there are many people trying to apply, trying to study abroad all by themselves. So I just wanted to put more light on that. Oh, so this is the thing. Now, when I started my scholarship, my international scholarship journey, I also didn't have any help because I couldn't be reaching out to Professor Henry for help for every step. He's a professor. He's busy. So I knew that I can't be reaching out to him. But when I see a young person, this was 2010, 2011. When I see a young person and then Facebook, yeah, we're just pretty new on Facebook at the time because I opened my account in 2009 and Facebook literally, you know, became popular in Nigeria around 2008. So um, as of 2010 and 11, you would see people travel abroad and talk about it that they are in the United States doing their master's or PhD. You send them a message. Um, so please, can you help me? I just want to understand how you did it so that I can know what to do. They will read your message and not reply. Mm. That was happening to me a lot of times. They will read your message and not reply. And so I didn't get the necessary support I needed. I didn't have the mentorship that will guide me right. I didn't have. But I still went on. Now, because I didn't have a mentor, I made a lot of errors. Mm. I made a lot of errors. And that's the reason why for my master's, I submitted 25 applications and I lost 23. Wow, 25? So, 25, and I lost 23, yeah. And so, when someone is telling me about rejection, I used to smile, like, <laughs> rejection. So, you had two, and you are shouting. Now, mm. for you, I've had 23. And the, the issue with the rejection that I had is that it was a series of rejections. So back to back, rejection, 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 until it got to 23. Now, the last two became victories. So I got 23 straight rejections. Then I had two more left. And I'm like, Omar, if I say these two go be rejection, so since the first 23, na rejection. Hmm. But as God will have it, those two were victories. I won the 24th one, and I won the 25th one. Now, the, tw the 24th one was a postgraduate scholarship at London Metropolitan University, LMU. And... But it covered just my school fees. So I still needed to pay for my flight and my living expenses. These guys traveled all the way to Nigeria to honor me. They awarded two Nigerians that year. So they came to Nigeria to honor myself and the other guy. It wow. was amazing. It was, it, it was my first international scholarship ever. Wow. They had it at Potia Hotel, Victoria Island. Very beautiful place. I went there with my family. My parents were there. My siblings were there. Everybody booming with smiles, excited. Um, important people graced the occasion. Um, and I accepted the scholarship. But I was struggling because I needed 3.2 million to pay for my flight and my living expenses. But I didn't have. So I was, in, <laughs> I was back to square one. I was running Helter Skelter, Kitty Kata. I did not get 3.2 million. As a matter of fact, my other brother was able to raise me 1 million. I still needed 2.2. <clears throat> and then, fortunately for me, the Commissioner for Science and Technology, Lagos State, attended that event. And he was so proud of me because I'm a son of the soil. So he told me... Said, oh, I'm sure that if we tell the governor, the governor at the time was Fashola. If we tell the governor, he'll be so happy and proud. I said, yes, importantly, I need some money for this thing. He now mm. said I should write an official letter to the governor requesting for the money I need. And he promised that he will personally deliver the letter himself. 
I was very happy. I wrote the letter, went to the Alausa office, went to his ministry, handed it over to him. And two weeks later, I got a reply. I got a reply through the um, secretary of the Lagos State Scholarship Board. And in that letter, the secretary of the Lagos State Scholarship Board was saying that he's writing on behalf of the governor to congratulate mm -hmm. me and to appreciate what I've done, representing the state very well. However, they don't have money to give me because uh, the state is broke. <laughs> and that uh, they don't have mo money to give me. I was so disappointed. Oh, God, you had no idea. It was like I was back to square zero. And... Mm. Um, while I was sulking, thinking I'm back to square zero, I completely forgot that there was a 25th scholarship that I applied for. I actually forgot. And as God will have it, one very hot <laughs> day, I was in Akure doing my normal job, lecturing. I just received this email. And it just informed me that I have been have been offered a Commonwealth scholarship. Wow. I completely forgot that I actually submitted that application. And that's how the very last application I submitted that year, the 25th one, ended up becoming the miraculous one. So what was the error I was making with all 23 scholarships? I need to say it now. The error I was making, many young people still make it today. And I'm tired of shouting. I'm always shouting on top of my lungs. Stop this error. But they don't listen. People want to learn from their personal experiences. And, I, and, and, and that's fine. Learn from your personal experience and you realize <laughs> what the right thing is. But what is this error? It is the error of waking up and just saying, I desire to study one course. Then you begin to apply for the course. When you don't have any background in it, you don't have any substantial experience. It's not what you studied. It's not directly related to what you studied in school. You also do not have even work experience in it. None at all. It's just a desire. I desire this course. I like it. Then you go and apply. No scholarship body will accept you. None. That's why I lost all those scholarships. Why? Because I was just doing, I desire, I desire, I desire. And I didn't have a mentor to tell me that is wrong. I didn't have anyone to tell me. So I learned the hard way. The scholarship, the very two scholarships I won, they were the only two that were very related to what I did. Very related. The Commonwealth one, it was so related to the project I did in Futa. The um, postgraduate scholarship at London Met, that one was related to what I did during my IT. Very related. In fact, word for word, what I did during my IT. And that's the reason why I got the two of them. So looking back, I could tell what went wrong and what was right. And right now, I decided to become the mentor I never had so that I can guide people better and not let them do 25 applications before they win. You don't need to do 25 today. Let me be the one to pay that price. You don't have to do that. With appropriate guidance, you just need to do about three and you would win. Because you will be more strategic than I was. So that's the story. So I believe that is, that is the motive that led to the formation of your company, right? Um, that actually wasn't the exact thing that led to the formation of Illumania. Um, so I've been helping people even before I created Illumania. I've been helping people since 2012. But Illumania was created in 2018, six years later. So what led to Illumania's creation is the fact that um, 
I was in the UK doing my PhD and it was my birthday in 2017. And I was celebrating it with friends in Spain. We went some, somewhere in uh, Barcelona to celebrate it. And that night when they were talking about me, you know when you do your birthday and your friends are making comments about you. One of them said to me, he said, I've noticed that you're amazing. You help people a lot with scholarships and they are winning. They are doing everything. It seems like you have a gift that goes around you and the gift is not only meant for you. It's also meant for anybody that associates with you because someone can be working hard, will not win anything. Once they come to me, they just win. And that was happening a lot. So he then said, "You need that's a talent and the gift of a man will make way for him. This is a business because there is a market. You need to start charging. Have a consultancy. Make it a corporate organization. And stop just doing, bring it, let me help you. Uh, bring it, let me do this. Let me. Have a structure. Let it have a legal backing. Register it with the CAC. Run it as a company. Have a system. If you do that, it's going to last longer than if you are just doing, uh, bring, bring it here and uh, let me just help you. And uh, let me just do this. Let me just do that. You are, you are not going to last long. And when he said that, <laughs> I told myself, this guy is speaking some sense. So when I got home after the trip, I went to think deeply about it. And this was July, 2017. So within six months, by January 2018, I created Illumania. And it cost me about 500,000 Naira to create. So when I'm charging people, and some people are crying foul that I'm charging, it used to make me smile or laugh. Mm. How do you think I manage that organization? How do you think I pay for the host? Because each time you visit, the website is up. How do you think I pay for host? How do you think I pay for cyber security so that it will not be hacked and all kinds of things? These things are paid in dollars. How do you think I pay for those things? The only way to have a sustainable business is if you profit from it. You need to profit. But I have done mine in a way that it's affordable. So when you come onto the platform, it's not a price that, that, that you go, oh my God, what, what kind of price is this? And it's deliberate. It's to make it affordable so that fresh graduates can still pay. But if you look at some other consulting firms and you hear how much they collect for CV, <laughs> you, you will know that we are very, very cheap. So, but it's deliberate because I still want it to be affordable. And for us, it's not about the profit. It's about social impact. And that's the reason um, we've been getting awards and recognitions because the social impact is really, really high. And we really don't focus a lot on the profit. Um, a way to defend that is our clients are treated like we are friends. You are our client for life because we will monitor you throughout to find out whether you have won. Have you won? Yes, you have won. We celebrate you. And you are a friend forever. And I've, now I can, I can boastfully tell you that I have a huge global network. A very huge one. That if I reach out to them and I say, guys, I want this done, they're going to do it. Because they feel that they owe me, even though I'm not asking for anything. But they feel that they owe me. They, they feel that, oh, I'm in Canada now doing so well. Because one guy did so, 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 so thing. And that's how I won this thing and I'm here. So if I today say, guys, can you help me do this? They always run to do it. But you know the funny thing? I don't ask. Because I really don't need anything from anyone. So I really don't ask, but my network is there the day I need it. And it's global. And to make, and to add more info to this, 
a number of them are known by you, but I don't mention their name so that you don't think I'm trying to farms. I'm not farms in anything. <laughs> but a number of them are popularly known by you already. But they came through me. But I won't sit on the phone and be telling you, oh, you know this person, I helped him. You know that person, I helped her. No, I don't have to do that. But the people that I help, they know themselves. And when I need help, they will come to my aid. But then, again, just as I said, I really don't need, I don't do these things because I need you to pay me back or do anything. No. So that's Illumania. It was because I needed some structure around it. And the advice I got from my friend was so essential. And I'm glad I did because now it has a name. It has, it's an entity. And that's the reason why British Council was able to invite me, you know, in 2019. That's the reason why the king in Ocean State was able to honor me because they know that it's an entity. You can browse and check. You can see what he's doing. It's not, it's not just something that has no structure. You are just doing. I'm just doing. I'm just helping people. I'm just helping people without any structure. It's not going to help you because the corporate world won't know how to describe what you are doing. Right? But if you put a structure around it, then the government will know how to describe, the corporate world will know how to describe what you're doing. So this is important for those of you that are into charity. At some point, you have to put a structure around it. And I need to also add this, charity sometimes has, has a very, um, um, the, the lifespan is very short. It's very short. Why? If you don't have a money bag that is constantly giving you money to run it, you will get tired eventually. You are going to burn out. And that's why for a country like Ni Nigeria, if you are doing a non-profit full-time, it can be very, very demanding. And that's why sometimes what you probably need to run is a social enterprise first. Run a social enterprise charge but put the profit back into the business. When you run a social enterprise, it is sustainable. When you become a rich man and you are now successful later in your life, you can dedicate some chunks of your earnings and do full-time charity. But you are a young person. You still never chop well, but you are running around about my charity, my charity. You are going to burn out. It's not a curse. It's a fact. You are going to burn out. Mm. So, so that's it. Now, there's another thing that you are you are into, which is Wadi. I hope I'm correct with the pronunciation, right? Yes, Wadi and, is uh, Yoruba. I just... Wadi. Oh yes, well, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I was asking about what I saw that you are the co-founder of uh, co-founder of Wadi, and uh, I saw that there are some of some opportunities for women there. So I just want you to talk to us about it. Okay, so for Wadi, um Actually, Wadi, <laughs> Wadi is a funny case. That one is a very funny situation. How that happened? Um, because th this time last year, it was not in existence. I, div I did not even have a clue that I was going to build a startup. I had no clue. This time last year, I had no clue whatsoever that I was going to build such a startup. Now, <clears throat> I was fortunate to get this scholarship last year called the NUTM scholarship, Nigerian University of Technology and Management. It's a new school here in Lagos. Now, when I heard about the full scholarship to learn about entrepreneurship, I took it and then um, I was accepted. And it's residential. So I needed to be on campus for a whole year, for a whole year. So that's how I joined. 
And then, while on campus, that's when we were told that since it's an entrepreneurship school to teach you more about business and technology, that we are going to build a real startup in that school. You are actually going to build one. So they are not going to come here and be teaching you concepts, principle. No, 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 no. It will be hands-on. You will build a startup. So they said, um, put yourself into groups, groups of five. Come up with a problem that you know that Nigeria has got. Most preferred, a problem that you have personally experienced. And then build a solution around it and build it into a startup. At the end of the day, there will be a competition and the winner of the competition will get a star prize. And so, for my cohorts at NUTM, there were 13 startups, 13 in total. And then my own startup was Wadi. So how did that happen? I had to pitch to my other four colleagues that, look, I... I remember that I used to have a problem when I was at the University of Manchester. Or not a problem, but I remember that I used to have it very convenient when I was at the University of Manchester that to access research items, you know, was so easy. Very, very easy. Well, the school is one of the best schools in the world, so I could understand why. Accessing research items were so easy. We had a platform that's almost like a Jumia for researchers. You just go in there, put all the items in a basket, pay for it online, and sit down where you are. Three days after, all your items will come to you. You know? Very easy. No issue at all. So when I returned to Nigeria and I joined FUTA, I rejoined FUTA as a lecturer. I was given a student to supervise, and that was the beginning of the headache. I realized that my students were finding it difficult to access research items. It was so, it was a big issue. Now, it wasn't just about research items. What even made it worse is research equipment. They don't even know how to find them. So let's say that I give you a work now to assess water samples and to check for a particular heavy metal and your university doesn't have the machine to detect the heavy metal then you need to ask yourself which laboratory or which university has got the machine can I tell you that there is no platform that will show you right now? No platform. There is nothing that you can check where you can just type in the name of the equipment and it will tell you the labs that are close to you that has got the equipment. None. So because we lack such a platform, people resort to asking friends. I need the GCMS. You will now hear, ah! Last time, Timo Bo, Ebi Unio, Zaria, Zaria Loa, you know, eh? Zaria, yes, so at the end of the day, that's what happened to a student of mine. He had to send the samples from Futa to Zaria. He spent nothing less than 100,000 naira, undergraduates, an undergraduate student. He spent nothing less than 100,000 naira to process his samples because he sent it to Zaria. I pitied him so much that I had to give him 30K to, to, to support because I, I pitied him. So I had to give him 30K to support. Now, after the analysis was done, can I shock you that three months later, I discovered that there is a lab in Lagos that has got that equipment. But we did not know. And it would have been cheaper because... The most of the money went to transportation, mm -hmm. transporting the sample because it was too far. But we did not know that there was a lab in Lagos here that they could have sent it to and should have been done for as low as 50k, half of the price. Now, 
it became clear to me what the solution is a digital platform that connects researchers to equipment using a geolocator tool such that you come you search and automatically it tells you that it's located here it's located there very very close it's not just that it will show you where it is it will also allow you make payment such that we will send dispatch riders to you get your samples from you and send it to the lab the analysis will be done the results will be emailed to you so it's not just that we are showing you the lab we are also giving you convenience Without you living where you are, your analysis can be done. And that is what Wadi is about. Now, that name is Yoruba coined from Iwadi investigation. Okay. I was... Yeah. I was... So okay. that's yes. the origin of that company. And as I told you, there were 13 startups. At the end of the day, during the competition, we won the competition as the most innovative startup of the year. Wow. Because it's the first time something like that will be happening. We have no competitor. And so the judges were so impressed that we could even come up with something like that. Because they know that young people don't talk about research. So this was a shocker to most of the judges. And um, yeah, that's how we won it. And ever since, yeah, we've been on it and we've been doing so well. So... Yeah, and then in addition to just connecting people to equipment, Wadi plans to do other things because there are other complementary needs. For example, publishing. And that's why recently we advertised that we need um, academic consultants that can help us review and write manuscripts because we want to encourage people to publish. And so we have a product called Publish It, where Anyone can come to us with their manuscripts and we review and recommend a journal that they can publish it in. And the journal will be free. That means they don't have to pay. So this way, it increases our publication rates and the world will know more about what we are doing in Africa. Our contribution to global research from Africa is very poor. It's less than 1%. Mm -hmm. And that's why the, the world always feels that Africa is sleeping. And the reason is because even the little research that we've tried to do, it just dies on the shelf. The world doesn't even know about it. But with Wadi, we are trying to change that. We improve the quality of research people are doing because we can connect them to equipment to process their samples. Why is this important? Imagine a lecturer, like there's a professor in my school. He's working on a herb. The herb has the potential to cure diabetes. He has tested it on rats and the result has been great. But he also needs to run it on a bigger an animal, like um, what's it called? A guinea pig. After he succeeds, he will now run it on humans. They, 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 they call that clinical uh, 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 test. But guess what? All these things I'm saying, he requires equipment to analyze samples to come back with a conclusion so that you can identify the active ingredients inside um, that um, drug that is responsible for the cure. Because if he's not able to identify it exactly, science will not be able to receive it as innovation so that he'll be able to patent it. Because he must be able to tell us this herb that you are giving people, what exactly is making them well? It requires some analysis and you are going to need equipment. And that's where we come in, connecting them to equipment. This way, he can produce a local alternative for the treatment of diabetes that will be cheaper than the imported drugs that we use that still does not work. Because most of the imported drugs are actually made for white people. All the samples that they use are white people. And by the time it comes to us, sometimes it doesn't fit with us because the genetics of a black man is different from that of a white man. So we probably need our own cure. And this is the larger picture of what our company, the impact of our company. So it's not just we are connecting people to 
equipment. No, the larger picture is that these people can go on to produce inventions, innovations that will cost R&D in Africa, improving the quality of life. So that's it. All right, sir. Thank you so much for your time, sir. And uh, you no, know, I just I believe it's possible that people here they just have one or two questions for you before we go. And I I believe Z, Z allows sir. Sure. Okay. Okay. I don't know if anybody here has any signify by raising up your hand. And I'll give you the opportunity to ask your question. Okay, uh, it seems there's no question. No. Is there anyone? Okay. Okay, it's Tolu, it's the Tolu want to have the question. Please, I'll move your mic now and ask your question. Yeah. Um, good evening, sir. Thank you so much for the wonderful question. And I would like to ask about the pneumonia. Um, if I'm to pay for like um, a session or something like that, will you be the one to attend to me? Is it, is it going to be a private coaching or will it be done on the platform or how will it be done? So I just want to know, sir. Okay, so it is not a mentorship platform. It's not a mentorship where we coach people. It's a consulting platform where when you go to the website, you will see all the things that we do, CV, review, SOP review. So when you have those drafts, you just send it to us that you want us to review them. And that's it. So you just send it, you want us to work on it, and we work on it, and we send it back to you. Now, we can go back and forth like two, three times until the quality is good, but payment is only once. And it doesn't have to be me. But most of the time, I like to handle jobs of people that know me per, uh, personally. And the reason why I do that is because if you know me personally, um, you probably be saying, I want you, I want you. But well, my consultants are very good. <laughs> they are very good because I also trained them. So they are as good as I am. And the point is, you even know the difference. And there are times when I'll say, I'll do it, no problem. Now, consultants go do them. I will give you back, but you'll be happy. You will say, ah, the review is say. And that the GO must lay hands on me. It must be that the GO, nobody else. But you know, the, the pastors that he anointed, God also moves in them. But you say you don't want them to lay hands on you. It must be Daddy Gio. And that's exactly the same concept that sometimes happens when clients come to us. They start insisting that it has to be me. But you know what? Sometimes we don't say anything. Because at the end of the day, the cocoa is that your work must be done. And that you like the quality of the work. And that's what has been the case. The work is done. You like the quality and you eventually win most of the time. Our success rate is 68%. So it's quite good. Um, so if you... You want to do CV, SOP, cold email, research proposal, observation letter, what is it exactly? There must be something. So... Once you have the document, and we don't need it for people because it's illegal, it's unprofessional, it's unethical, it's not right. You have your draft, and then you come with your draft, then we work on the draft. So, and you make your payment, send work, we do it, we send it back to you at a stipulated time, and that's job done. So that's how we work. Okay. Um, um, I believe that question has been wonderfully answered. Okay, so uh, sir, on a final note, I just want to, to give us a, a word of advice for people who are here, and many people will be watching this after now. I have hundreds that will watch this after now. So I just want you to give a, a general uh, piece of advice to them. Thank you. 
my story I can see clearly that I'm a genius. Even though people want to say he's a genius, I, I remember G dot NG wrote an article about me last year. The genius has won eight scholarships. You know, I was just laughing when I am like, these guys don't even know. They don't <laughs> they don't know that this guy is not a genius at all. If I am, I won't feel this was happened to me. I won't. Um, so the first advice I want to give is be a hard worker because that concept is gradually dying off in 2022 and they are replacing it with soft work. <laughs> Don't deceive yourself. Hard work still pays and there's nothing you can do about it. Be a hard worker. Be fond of putting in your everything in anything that you do. If it's associated with you, be fond of giving your all. When you give your all, that is when people will think you are a genius. <laughs> they will think you're a genius because you'll be doing things that geniuses do. But within your heart, you will know that your secret weapon is hard work. So be someone that is very receptive to giving your everything. It's not going to be easy. You'll be sweating. But realize that it is the price that needs to be paid. At the end of the day, when you are eating the fruit of your labor, it will be so sweet because it's your sweat. It will be so sweet because it's your sweat. Because I remembered when we won the startup of the year. And on my graduation, they called us all out one by one to come receive a certificate at NUTM. It was amazing. That day, I walked confidently and I enjoyed it. The sweetness was so much. I enjoyed it because I couldn't understand how someone coming from academia, who is still a lecturer, can go to an entrepreneurship school and win it, win the startup of the year. You know, it's, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah, and you'll be asking yourself, how did you even do it? That's because I put my everything into anything I do. That's the first advice. The second advice. Um, don't be too carried away by activities online. May, many of them are lies. I'm glad about the story of um, uh Osh Poppy coming to display wealth, and at the end of the day, we see, we have seen clearly that the guy is a scammer. Secondly, is Lion, the kidnapper, but will come out and be telling people, Oh Zulu, oh, Ashe Bros, they kidnap people. So if you are the kind that your job is you stay on the internet, admiring people, and just Walking yourself up unnecessarily and saying, ah, how I wish, ah, look at my age mates, ah, putting on due pressure on yourself. Not appreciating where you are because you want to be where others are. You know what's going to happen? What's going to happen is you'll be, you'll be wearing yourself out and reason. So that's the life you want. You want a life that understands your time is your time and your time will come. You want a life that will embrace reality and you will not be ashamed by it. You want a life that is not unnecessary, you know, jealous people. Jealous people's wins. Looking at those wins and the next thing, rather than be with them happily, you are now sad, downcast, you can't do that to yourself. So my second advice, don't put unnecessary pressure on yourself because of what you see on the internet. Give yourself the permission to fail. Give yourself the permission to grow. Understand that growth takes time. And permanent growth actually takes time. Anything that is fast, fian, 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 doesn't last long. 
So you need to realize that you should take it easy. My final advice. <clears throat> this one I always like to tell young people all the time. The reason is because they feel that they need to um, do many things. You are in the age, you are in the internet age where people have access to materials. They have access to information. They have access to so many things. So they feel the need to do everything. You talk to a young person today. Tell me what you do. And you'll be hearing things like, whoo, whoa, I'm into many things though. I'm an, I'm an author, I'm a content writer, I'm a photographer, I'm a kinikan, I'm a kinikan, I'm this. I'm also a cheerful, I'm also a diesel. And they think it's fun. <laughs> My dear, you are setting yourself up for confusion because someone will look at you and will be confused on how to help you. They won't know how to help you. Because even some employers won't know what job to give you. Because you are forming Bobo Niche. Yorubas used to call it Bobo Niche. You know when you have a drug that somebody will say, this drug is Bobo Niche, it can cure all the diseases in this world. Someone will say, oh God, take it easy now. There is no drug that can cure all diseases. What exactly does this drug do? That means there will be a question. What exactly do you do? Because you can't be everywhere. Eh, I'm, a, I'm a photographer. I'm also a chef, you know. I also write, you know. But then I studied accounting. Like, come on, come on, come on. What you want to do instead is identify, know how to separate hobby from career. Because young people have mixed everything up. It's not a career line. But your career line must be your career line. And you must know what it is. So imagine it this way. Your career line is the vine. Your hobbies are the branches. Then the branches can come out of the vine. But know what your vine is. Mm -hmm. Know what your vine is. Because that is your career. The others are now coming out of it. So you could say, I'm an accountant, but I love cooking. So in my spare time, I'm a chef. That makes sense. I understand you. Not that you say, oh, I do a lot of things. I'm a chef. I'm a this. I'm a that. I'm a photographer. I'm a clinician. But I'm also an accountant. Like you, you would, I'm going to be confused. So the concept is specialize first when you complete your education from the university specialize first and when you specialize specialize in one thing specialize first then later you can now generalize so specialize first then later you generalize that means later on you can start entering into many things and at that point people will be how you enter many things why because you are with a wealth of experience from your specialization. You are coming with a wealth of experience. So I allow you. Right now, I am generalizing. I'm trying my hands in entrepreneurship, trying my hands in a lot of things. I'm working because I'm bringing a lot of experience from academia where I've been working for many years because I specialized there. So, so that's the same thing I'm telling you guys. Specialized first, generalized later. That's it. Thank you. Wow. Specialized first, then generalized later. All right, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I must actually uh, tender my my gratitude to you for this great opportunity. And uh, on behalf of everyone that is watching now or that will be connecting later, I want to appreciate you for taking your time. I know you are so, so busy and yet you are so passionate about, you know, transferring values to younger generations. So I want to appreciate you for this opportunity, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, thank you for having me, Jacob. Thank you. And thank you also for the few people here listening. I know that um, the rest of you will definitely listen later. Mm -hmm. So 
Thank you so much again for having me. All right. All right, sir. And everyone, thank you for connecting today. So this will be the end of our show today. And I pray that God will grant you success as you plan to study abroad. So for now, I want to say thank you for connecting and bye for now. Bye.